now you're a, 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 a partner. You're you know you're an owner. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you are an entrepreneur. I, I do believe that you're running your own business within a business. We do. Okay, I feel the same way with with, with my profession. Um, so. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about it. If you're not, then just tell me. But what does it mean? Because I know every uh, uh, firm has different sort of rules around partnership. And, and so is it real equity or is it just a profit sharing? What does it mean to become a partner at, at, at an accounting firm? Or specifically here, if, if, again, you don't have to go through too many details. No, no, that's okay. And we'll, we'll let the managing partner talk at a moment. <laughs> which version of my partnership would read it? Redo, would you like me to discuss? Uh, because, because and, and, and it has changed over the years. You know, when when we became partner, it was only equity. But you only came in, and you had a piece of the bottom line, okay. and that piece changed year to year depending on contribution, and, and it wasn't actually very big at the beginning. Um, and some people took a pay cut to become partner at the time, okay. uh, which you know you really had to have a long term vision to to know that you wanted to stay, which we did. Or want to run the cycle. Or one, you know, rubber rubber room. <laughs> Rubber balls, rubber whatever. So the, so so okay. So uh, you actually have to at one point you actually have to pay. So you equity, have to put, you have to buy into you have the to business. Buy into the business. So you okay. have to take out a personal loan and buy in. Now the firm does co-sign the loan. Okay. So even if you have no other equity or assets, it's easy. The bank will it, it, you know certainly will put uh, put their their money behind that. Okay. Uh, and and you have to get in. And every year stands on its own. So you do have a piece of the pie. That piece of the pie can change a little bit each year, depending on contribution, because not everybody is consistent year after year. Although we, you know, we we, we judge it and we don't we don't you know prop people up huge amounts in one year or drop people too low just because of one bad or one great year. Um, but the evolution is such that today it's not just about not a partner just owning the bottom line. Now there's partners that don't have equity that don't have a piece of that bottom line. Uh, but they still sit around the table and they still help run the firm because they give great input in other areas. Mm -hmm. It's also a question of risk. Some people don't want the risk of, you know, God forbid something happens, the partners that have equity, if something blows up, you're, you're, on, the hook. you're on the hook. If, yeah. Uh, I'll stop there and. I, it's a perfect. I mean, we, we, we've evolved from the partnership model partially from, I guess, uh, necessity partially because times change, and partly from my belief that the partnership model is a really terrible business model at the end of the day. Uh, it's something that Why? was inherited. Well, you know, you, you, you said everybody comes in, they get a piece of the bottom line, which you're neglected to bring in, is everybody has an opinion. Everybody comes in under an equity component environment thinking since they're an equity owner, they have a say in what color the carpet is and what color the wallpaper should be and why we should be doing this and why we should be doing that and why isn't Josh doing this and why doesn't Mike do this to tell him to tell him to somebody else because they all have something in the fray. So, you know, I look at this and I, and I have this conversation with when I'm talking about the, the, the concept of saying how many of our clients if we walked into that owned the business, would we say let... 12 of them sit around the table and openly discuss what we should be doing. Very few. Very few. Because we would look, the, look at it as consultants and go, it's not conducive to making a decision. So to me, the corporate model of the CEO, the board, and the partnership makes more sense. Very hard to change over time unless you're, what do you guys like to call me? The dictator, the benevolent <laughs> dictator, and then a few other things that, that come out. Philosopher um, King. Yeah, that's not I'm quite sorry, it. I'm sorry, but you're in the room. When you're out of the room, we'll tell you. Oh, me. I know. <laughs> and trust me, I know what it is, too. Um, there's always somebody willing to kiss my ass and tell me, so. <laughs> I'm not kissing <laughs> So what you end up with is you end up with, a, you have to. You, you will, so the way we operate, which a lot of firms do, is you operate with an executive committee that's voted in by the partners. Mm -hmm. You have a managing partner who either is voted in, gets the short straw, whatever the case is, ends up as managing partner, who then really is the CEO of the organization. Now, you can run everything by committee, which I don't believe is conducive. Now, at, certainly at the beginning, those people that are coming in, it's a lot easier to run by committee than it is 14 years into a managing partner stint. I like to joke, I'm, I'm in year 14 of a four-year contract. And, and, and it's very difficult given my personality to sit around the table all the time and go, what do you think? Okay, now, there's a lot of consensus building, but it's usually done outside the room. 
Okay, so when we come in, we're efficient at what we're doing on things. So not everybody's going to agree, and not everybody likes necessarily my, you know, benevolent dictator approach to things. But our partnership agreement is such that I can be voted out at any time should they so decide that it's not working for them. So we've kind of morphed from a true partnership model more into a corporate model. However, it, it's a hard, it's a hard sell. Um, We're and still small enough that we all talk to each other and we all. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can't put everybody into isolation like your 50 partners and say, I'll talk to you in December. But you still have to be relatively streamlined. And we are still very, and most of the bigger decisions are still very consensus building. Okay. On a lot of stuff, you know, same as you would in any other organization, you appoint people to do the work. If you don't like it, then move them. So that, that's part of it. it. Having done that, what it's done is it's allowed us to look at our partnership model and change quality, not quality, levels of partners. Okay, based on where we need people coming in. So traditionally what we had, because we were an older partnership as Josh said, the young partners came in as equity partners and the older partners, some of them even wanted to wind down before they hit retirement age, which for us is 65. So we worked out non-equity type arrangements. So as they phase down, well then you, now you get into a discussion of maybe you've got a, a, a potential partner who's valuable, who doesn't have a client base, who doesn't really fit the equity type of environment because they can't grow a practice but are still valuable so there's a non-equity but that non-equity should they be on the risk for professional model versus somebody else so we've probably got about six different categories of partners okay, okay that we have changed and i wasn't joking when i said that we've probably rewritten the partnership agreement about seven times in the last 10 years okay because every time we get a different situation you have to customize it. Right. So instead of fitting the partner model, partnership model, we build our partnership agreement around what works. But it, that can also work in attracting good partners. It does. Right? It does. We created opportunities where normally we couldn't sell them as partner because it didn't fit into the mold. So we had to be a little more flexible. And I, and I think that will continue to evolve mm -hmm. over time. And the next thing we're going to start to see are going to be over time, and, and I'm sure somebody's going to throw something at me for this, but a part-time partner. You know, somebody for whatever reason, whether that's, uh, you know, somebody with children, male or female, that wants to spend time under a paternity and maternity time off. Well, that's that's you a like uh, lifestyle uh, choice. Yeah. That's all you're you're yeah. touching on a big uh, millennial concern, yes. right? Is that the balance of, of life? Don't say it. Down? Don't <laughs> say work life balance. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, just life balance. balance. It's, it's not just work life balance, it's just <laughs> life balance. One of those terms that makes my skin crawl. <laughs> Fair enough. And I'll, so, tell you, I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because for the longest time, I want work-life balance meant I don't want to do something. So it has a negative connotation to some of us, some of us that are a little bit older than the millennials. So it wasn't about finding a way to make it work, it was about me not wanting to do something. So that's my no, so, so it, it's, I think the millennials have a bad rap. Okay? 100%. And, and I, I, my view on millennials is I think that these people are more technological than oh. any new generation has 100%. ever been prior. And I think that they're aware that you know where they fit in the corporate world well, was before it used to be there well you, you get a corporate job and you you know the the, the pipe dream of you, you'll be there forever 100%, 100%. so they're more selfish but we've made them more selfish in a, in a certain way but they're extremely productive yeah i'm not sure i mean selfish is a harsh term i mean there are days yeah. where we definitely look at each other and go yes they're selfish well selfish, but they're selfish that, that, under our terms yeah, yeah. well s selfish mm -hmm. in that okay they want to be able to add a lot of value to a company mm -hmm. but they also expect the company to be able to add value to them right Right? So, that's what I mean by they're selfish. They're concerned, you know, it's a two-way street. It's not just a one-way street, what could you do for the company? It's, well, the 100%. company has to do something for you too, right? 100%. And, and, and it's forced, I think, the thought process to change on, on how we hire, what we do, you know, how we work, remote work location, you know, stuff like you know, everything that kind of fits into that millennial. Funny enough, the next generation's coming up, not quite the same thing. You're already starting to see a change in work habit or style or it's like everything, right? What do we do when we had, when we were a kid? You said I'm never going to be like my parents, so you go to the other end of the spectrum. What do my kids do? They went to the other end of the spectrum from what I did. Sure. You know, funny enough, we had this conversation the other day. We look at some of the things that are happening in this firm now with the new generation, and it's almost full circle to where we were 30 years ago. Why? Because it's a generational change for the sake of change in some cases. Sure. And, and it's very interesting because the, 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 the dynamic associated with it, we have a tendency, like every gen older generation, to poo-poo the next generation's contribution. They're too lazy, they don't want to work hard, <laughs> you know, man, at the end of the day, maybe they want to work smarter. Maybe they want to do something different. Maybe they actually want to have a life that 
you know, what's a life? Uh, and, and, and I'll say, not not all, uh, talk about different generations, we're talking about millennials, not all millennials are created equal. Oh, no. So I just uh, want to point out there that there is a generalization and it just doesn't always I think it's unfair because, uh, so the other thing I will say, yeah. I think parents mm -hmm. are as much at fault for the millennials' oh, bad rap absolutely. Absolutely. than the kids themselves. I, 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 as you a know. parent of three, I see and, I'm, and, and I cringe sometimes. Little, little Johnny yeah. and little Sarah get a star today because they put their shoes on and pee in the toilet. Yeah. Sorry, that's not a star earning endeavor. That's, that's bodily function. You shouldn't get a star for that. But we've grown them, teaching them that everything they do is perfect. Everything they do is worthy. Participation. Yeah, it's the participation. Yeah. Nobody wins, nobody loses. It, so we've created, we see it. And the problem is, is most parents as it was when I coached my son's hockey team, parents send their kids elsewhere to be taught because they're not home. They don't spend the time teaching the kids. So they send the hockey and the hockey coach is supposed to teach them discipline. They come to the job and we're supposed to teach them how to accept constructive criticism. Ever tell a millennial in his first job or her first job that she didn't do something right? Duck. <laughs> there's a there's a great uh, TED talk. If you watch TED talks, one of the great TED talk speakers is Simon Sinek. Sure, sure, and, sure, sure. Uh, Simon has a, Simon right. has well, finding your why, but he does another. There's he does many of them. Yeah. Yeah. But there is one uh, where he sits down and he's doing this interview, and it's only about five minutes or six minutes, but it is about millennials, and uh, and he really hits on uh, a lot of these topics, and he's he's very eloquent with with. Um, with how he describes it. Well, I think that the important aspect is not whether we agree, but whether we understand. Mm -hmm. And how do we make it work in an environment that allows all of us to accomplish what we need to accomplish? And because it's not the way, you know, maybe to us a corner office or a parking spot or your name on the wall as the top salesman, at, you know, Tim Hortons or whatever, the employee of the month meant something to us, doesn't mean that. Because they're already getting that gratification from being told that, what you did was really good. You did a good job in school. You did a good job here. So they're already getting that gratification. So we've got to find something else that makes them tick. I'm sure a lot of them, and this is where I think what they have to offer, they're socially conscious, they're environmentally conscious, they are family conscious more so than previous, the last couple of generations. So they've got a lot to offer. We have, to, our job is to find the way to make that work. No. And I won't so lie to you, it's not no, simple. Not simple. Not simple at all. So I just have to say one thing. Uh, we have Anne with us today, who's uh, helped producing this podcast. Oh, yeah. Doing a great job. <laughs> and I just put, ever since we started talking about millennials, she perked up. Oh, I saw, I saw it too. I saw the look. She's like, <laughs> what are you going to say next, boys? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to start picking on you. You're going to start picking on women next too? Is that it? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Was that okay? Was that respectable? <laughs> okay, she gave, she gave a thumbs, thumbs up. up. That's right. Funny, I didn't see a thumb. <laughs> <laughs>